Hi, I'm Dr. Adira Levin and privileged to be the co-chair of the KDGO Clinical Practice Guideline for the Evaluation and Management of Chronic Kidney Disease. I'm going to share with you today some key takeaways for nephrologists in the management of people with CKD. We need to treat people with chronic kidney disease with a comprehensive treatment strategy to reduce the risks of progression of that kidney disease and its associated complications. This approach should encompass education, lifestyle, exercise, smoking cessation, diet and medications where and when indicated. The more comprehensive the care strategy, the better the outcomes. So we really want to emphasize this holistic approach to care for clinicians. As we continue, I'm going to get a little bit more specific about what that comprehensive strategy actually looks like. In this guideline, we have encouraged a healthy and diverse diet with a higher consumption of plant-based foods as compared to animal-based foods. At the same time, we want to encourage a lower consumption of ultra-processed foods. These dietary changes have the potential to benefit not just progressive kidney disease, but its complications as well. Things like acidosis, hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. And with this strategy, less risk of protein energy wasting. A shared decision-making model with the patient and consultation with a renal dietitian or someone accredited as a nutrition provider will be the key to improving adherence to dietary changes, and that may significantly benefit a person with CKD. Blood pressure control is, of course, very important in the management of chronic kidney disease. And while we should aim for blood pressure targets of systolics of less than 120 millimeters of mercury using standardized blood pressure measurement tools, we also want to be mindful that the whole picture of health is important in the people that we treat. So we emphasize an individualized approach to blood pressure targets and blood pressure lowering therapy with RAS inhibitors, especially in people who are frail, at high risk of falls, have symptomatic postural hypotension or a very limited life expectancy. Both RAS inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to delay the progression of kidney disease in a number of high-quality randomized control trials. These trials include people both with and without diabetes. As one of our recommendations, SGLT2 inhibitors should be used to treat people without diabetes, but perhaps with a more individualized approach depending on their level of albuminuria. In people with chronic kidney disease and heart failure, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors confer benefits irrespective of albuminuria. After lifestyle interventions, the use of RAS inhibition, SGLT2 inhibitors, and the starting of moderate or high-intensity statins, these are all considered first-line therapies for most people that we treat for chronic kidney disease. The guideline sets a very specific threshold for changes in GFR after we start therapy, and I want to call attention to that here because there's a lot of misconceptions about that. Initial dips in eGFR are absolutely expected following initiation of any hemodynamically active therapy. GFR reductions of greater than 30% from baseline exceed the expected variability, and so any of those changes, that big of a change, should prompt a review into other causes and does warrant close monitoring. Next, we have some very important guidance to estimate 10-year cardiovascular risk. We advocate using validated risk tools that incorporate CKD to guide treatment for prevention of cardiovascular disease. Importantly, we stress that chronic kidney disease is not a contraindication for an invasive strategy for people with acute or unstable heart disease, nor is it a contraindication for imaging studies. However, the risks and the benefits should be determined on a very individual basis. Strategies to mitigate risks from imaging studies using contrast media are easily implemented. Again, looking through the lens of a comprehensive management strategy, it's really important to recognize that people with CKD often have complex medication regimens, and they're seen by multiple specialists. So we really need to take seriously the need to perform a thorough medication review periodically and at every transition of care to assess adherence, the continued indication of those medications, and any potential drug interactions. It's really important to review and limit the use of over-the-counter medicines, dietary and herbal remedies that may be harmful for people with chronic kidney disease. For most people and in clinical settings, validated eGFR equations using serum creatinine are appropriate for drug dosing. But remember that a validated measured GFR is the most accurate. Further on the topic of medications, we really want to stress a point about discontinuation and restarting. If you stop a medication during an acute illness, it's really important to communicate a clear plan of when to restart those medications, both to the affected person and their healthcare providers. 
Furthermore, we call out in the guideline that the plan should be documented in the medical record. We know that failure to restart these medications may lead to unintentional harm and expose people to risk. Identifying and assessing symptoms in people with kidney disease is very important for a variety of reasons. There's a need to systematically evaluate those symptoms in a consistent way. In so doing, we may highlight changes in clinical management, severity of symptoms, and ultimately redirect treatment towards patient-centered management, which might lead to discussion also about appropriate and supportive care options. The key principles in managing people with kidney disease is to have effective communication and shared decision-making. Those two principles between healthcare professionals and the people they treat leads to effective decision-making. That allows people to work in partnership to identify the symptom burden, possible treatment strategies, and really take care of the person and their family. As this audience may well know, plans addressing future healthcare states should be jointly agreed upon between people with chronic kidney disease and their families, carers, and everyone else involved in their care. Advanced care planning for those choosing supportive care is particularly important. This is a process that involves understanding, communication, and frank discussion between a person with chronic kidney disease, their family, caregiver, and all the healthcare professionals for the purpose of clarifying preferences for end-of-life care. Chronic kidney disease is a lifelong condition, and at every stage, the people we care for need to pay some measure of attention towards the future and the treatment choices they may need to make with very careful consideration. On behalf of everyone involved in creating this guideline, I want to say that we're all very proud of the work that we've done. We hope it will meaningfully support clinicians and the people at risk for and living with kidney disease that we all care for around the world. The full clinical practice guideline can be accessed online at www.kdigo.org.